I'm just going to pray right now that God gives us the ability to focus, not be about the clock or things that we have going on afterwards. Father, I do pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. Help us to focus in on your word. Help us to hear from you. Lord, we trust that everything that's been sung, everything that's been said, every prayer that's been offered has all been part of your providential plan this morning. Not a word less, not a word more. And so we rest in that. We thank you for what you're going to speak to us through your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're uh, coming to the end of our short journey through the book of Judges. We've been going through Judges, and, and, and we did not go verse by verse through the entire book as we have um, in the past with other books, other series that we've done. Rather, what we did is we took some time to talk about Judges in general, and then we looked at the lives of four, well, three, today four, different judges uh, throughout the book. And you may remember, a few weeks back, we started things off by looking at the life of Deborah. We then took some time to look at the life of Gideon. And then last week, we learned some things from Jephthah. And through all of this, we have seen, at least I hope we've all seen, how God has used flawed individuals to accomplish His purposes. Not so perfect people to get done the things that God wants to get done. And hopefully you've also learned some things along the way that has caused you to think about your own walk with the Lord. Places where perhaps you're falling short. That maybe you could do a better job of honoring God in your life. Today, we're going to finish things off by looking at the last and perhaps the most famous judge in the book of Judges, and that's Samson. Now, I am sure that most all of you here today have heard of Samson before. Samson was the 12th and final judge in Israel's history. And he, and as mentioned, he's, he's probably the most famous out of all of them. At least the book of Judges spends the most time talking about him than any of the other judges. But here's the thing about Samson that I was struck with as I was thinking about this this week. When you, when you think about Samson, Okay, go back to the flannel graph if that's for you or whatever it may be. When you think about Samson, what is the thing that sticks out the most about him? What? He's a strong dude, right? His strength. Samson was incredibly strong. Probably the strongest man that has ever lived. And when we think of Samson, that's immediately what comes to mind. His strength. But in my mind, as I thought about that, that is very telling and sad in many ways. Samson is remembered only as a strong man, not a great man. I want you to think about that for a second. Samson's remembered as a strong man, not a great man. Samson could have been great. He should have been great, but he wasn't because he wasted the gifts that God had given him. I know that Samson is often held up as a hero in many respects. When you read the children's Bible stories, that's how Samson comes across. But in many respects, he was Israel's worst judge out of all of them. Samson lived a life of continued unfaithfulness to the Lord, and he wasted the gifts that God gave him. This is in spite of a great start. I invite you to turn with me to Judges chapter 13, if you haven't already, as we look at the life of Samson this morning. Samson had an amazing start to his life. I mean, he took off like a rocket. In fact, Samson was chosen by God even before conception. Samson was chosen by God even before conception. Now, I don't know if the slides are coming up or not, but that's the first fill-in. Samson was chosen by God even before conception. And his birth was pronounced prophetically by an angel of the Lord. Listen as I read through chapter 13 of Judges. And I'm just going to read the chapter. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. We've heard this over and over and over, this cycle. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. 
Now, see to it that you drink no wine or any other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And the woman went to the husband and told him, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God. He was very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name, but he said to me, You will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from birth until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, I beg you, let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah. The angel of God came again to the woman, while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. And the woman hurried to tell her husband, He's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and he followed his wife. When he came to the, woman, or to the man, he said, Are you the one to talk to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule for the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine, or any other fermented drink nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I've commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that this was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that we may honor you when your word comes true. He replied, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. And Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched as the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor show us all these things, or now, or how he told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy, named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahana, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtahol. What an amazing start to a life! I mean, Israel's done evil. God's decided to raise up a deliverer. We've seen this. They've, he's been set apart even before birth through a prophetic, angelic pronouncement by the Lord. I mean, what an amazing thing. We also see at the end of the chapter that these things happen just as the Lord said. God is blessing Samson as he grows and the Spirit begins to stir in his young hearts. It's exactly what we see. Everything's coming to... This is going to be great. Maybe Israel is finally going to get it all right and be released from their bondage. Surely things are on a good and upward trajectory, right? It's got to be. Now, there's something else that needs to be mentioned about Samson and his being set apart by the Lord. We noticed in verse 7 of chapter 13 that Samson is to be a Nazarite of God from birth until the day of his death. This is crucial. Samson is to be a Nazarite of God from birth until the day of his death. And this is such an important piece of information to keep in mind as you read about Samson. To be a Nazarite was to take a vow unto the Lord which set you apart as holy for a period of time. And it's spelled out in Numbers chapter 6 verses 1 through 21. Just jot that down. I'm not going to go read that to you or take you there right now. Number 6, 1 through 21 is where you can go read about a Nazarite vow if you want later on this afternoon. However, I just want to highlight to you what a Nazarite vow entailed. A Nazarite vow was a voluntary vow that someone took to set themselves apart to the Lord for a period of time. That's what it was. Someone voluntarily stepped into a Nazarite vow to set them apart for a, a period of time. The vow consisted of abstaining from alcohol and any grape product, no cutting of the hair, 
and no contact with a dead body. Those were the three things that you needed to keep as you had a Nazarite vow. They were to be followed as long as the Nazarite vow was in effect. Now, Samson's vow, in a sense, if you want to call it a vow, it's unusual in that it was involuntary and it was to last a lifetime. Samson was to keep this Nazarite vow for his life. And he didn't voluntarily enter into it. He didn't take the vow. The Lord placed it upon him. And he was bound to all the stipulations from birth to death. God had extraordinary things in store for Samson And so he placed extraordinary stipulations on his life. Again, this is very critical to the story because, as we will see, Samson breaks all three stipulations of his vow. Samson breaks every commitment. He breaks them all. The first stipulation Samson breaks is found in chapter 14, verse 9. Samson has been going back and forth between his home and Timnah because he has his eyes on a young Philistine woman. He likes her. So he's going back and forth. Now listen to chapter 14, verses 5 through 9. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother, and as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. He told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. Some time later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. In it was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands, and he ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it, but he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Did you catch what happened here? Samson, he's attacked by a young lion as he's out on the road. The Spirit of God comes upon him so that he actually rips this lion apart with his bare hands. Both disgusting and incredible simultaneously. I mean, that's a mind picture. That in and of itself is not a bad thing. However, sometime later when Samson is going back to get married, he sees the carcass of the lion on the side of the road, and wouldn't you know it, it's filled with honey. Wow. What a lucky break for Samson, because you know what? He's been traveling for a time, and he's hungry. So he he goes up to the carcass, and he gets some honey. This is completely unacceptable for Samson. And that's why I think he didn't tell his parents where it came from. He knows this is unacceptable. What is a carcass of a young lion? A dead body. What is Samson not supposed to have contact throughout his entire life with? A dead body. Stipulation number one is broken. The next stipulation that we see Samson break is actually found in the very next verse, 14.10, right after the account of the young lion. Listen to chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. Now his father went down to see the woman, and Samson made a, fat, or made a feast there, as was customary for bridegrooms. When he appeared, he was given 30 companions. Now, I know that I'm speculating a little bit here, but I believe I'm right in doing so. I don't feel any check in speculating this. If you remember, another stipulation of the Nazarite vow was that Samson was to abstain from alcoholic drink for a lifetime. Verse 10 says that Samson made a feast as was customary for the bridegroom. Samson did not just have a party to celebrate his marriage. No, he gave a feast as was customary. Do you know what a feast as was customary at that time would have included? Alcohol, wine in particular, and lots of it. In fact, it was customary not unlike today, to have many toasts and blessings to the bridegroom, which were then capped off with a drink of alcohol. It would sort of be like saying that Samson went to Las Vegas to throw a big bachelor party, as was customary with the young men of the day. I am sure we can infer a lot of things with that statement, none of which would be good. I believe it is more than safe to say 
that Samson has now broken stipulation number two. Lastly, we see that Samson breaks stipulation number three in probably the most famous account from his life, his tragic indiscretion with Delilah. Listen to chapter 16, verses 4 through 21. Sometime later again, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. You see, I, I skipped over all these great things where Samson's been destroying the Philistines left and right. And they've had it. They want to be done with this guy. So they say to Delilah, Hey, find out if we can subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh thongs that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh thongs that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the thongs as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to the flame, so the secret of his strength was not discovered. And Delilah said to Samson, You've made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me, how can you be tied? He said, well, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes, and she tied him with them. And with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off with his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, until now you've been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me, how can you be tied? Boy, this guy's thick-headed. <laughs> he replied, well, if you were to use... Weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and then tighten it with the pin. Well, then I'll become as weak as any other man. Well, so wouldn't you know it, while he's sleeping, Delilah takes the seven braids of his head, wove them in the fabric, tighten them with the pin. Again, she called him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin with the loom, with the fabric. And she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. Well, I question that in some ways, given his other actions, but if my head was shaved, my strength would leave me, and I had become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she went to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more. He's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands, and having put him to sleep in her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. And she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you, and he awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. Not a great deal to say here because I believe it's very clear what has happened. Samson was not to have his hair cut, but what is he allowed to have happen? Have his hair shaved off. Samson has now broken all three stipulations, and the result of this is so chilling, really. Listen again to verse 20. And she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Samson thinks he's just going to continue on as he always had. But the Lord had left him and he didn't even know it. God had left him and he had no clue. Samson had been slipping away from God for some time when God finally said, Enough! I'm out of here! Do it on your own if that's what you want to do, Samson! And Samson didn't even know the Lord had left. That is just... I, I can't even imagine that. Would you notice if the Lord left? I ask you that seriously. If God just left this church or your home or your life, would you even notice it? Or have you become so intertwined with the world around you 
that you wouldn't even have a clue that he was gone. Now, we know from the rest of chapter 16 that God does bring glory to his name by vindicating Samson one last time, but the damage has already been done. Samson could have been remembered as a great man, the deliverer of Israel. Instead, he's gone down in history as a very strong but flawed man. What a tragic and sad story. Samson had such an amazing beginning to life. He was destined for greatness, but he ended in humiliation. Why? I believe Samson had a very critical flaw, and it completely ruined him. Samson's problem was he was selfish. Samson was selfish. He was one selfish guy. Samson was not supposed to touch a dead body, but he didn't care. He was hungry. And so he did not obey God in order to feed his appetite. Samson was lustful. He pursued the wrong kind of women. He did not pursue God-honoring women. No, he constantly went after pagan women who would satisfy his physical desires. His parents Try to talk him out of it in verse 3 of chapter 14. But Samson basically says, hey, Dad, keep your mouth shut and go get her for me because I want her. That's my paraphrase of verse 3. He spends the night with a prostitute in chapter 16, verse 1. And I believe it's safe to say they did not spend the night reading Scripture and praying to the Lord. He yokes himself with yet another pagan woman, Delilah, who winds up bringing him to his end. Samson was selfish. He wanted things that women could provide him, and so he took them to satisfy himself. I believe that through all of this, Samson did not suffer from lack of knowledge. He suffered from lack of obedience. Samson didn't suffer from lack of knowledge. He suffered from lack of obedience. The spirit was with Samson as he grew. His parents asked, how are we supposed to bring up. I believe they insulted things in their young son. Told them all about an Azurite vow. The spirit was with Samson. God's touch was on him. I believe he knew what it meant to be a Nazarite. In fact, he tells Delilah that. He knew God had called him to something great, but in the end, he did not obey because he wanted what he wanted, when he wanted it, and he would disobey to get it. Understand Samson's character. He wanted what he wanted, when he wanted it, and he would disobey even in order to get that thing for himself. I mean, I can almost picture it. Samson was traveling down the road to Timnah, and he's hungry. And there on the side of the road, well, there's that dead lion, but it's got honey in it now. Boy, would that taste good. I I know I'm not supposed to touch a dead body, Lord, but I want some of that honey And so rather than wait for God to provide what I need, I'm going to disobey to satisfy my cravings. And then you know what? Nothing happened. The sky didn't open up. There was not a big strike of lightning. Maybe sin is not such a big deal after all, he must have figured. And then the same thing happens at the wedding feast, with the alcohol, and so on. Maybe it really doesn't matter if I follow the Lord. Samson, over time, subtly slipped away from the Lord, and he became more and more disobedient as he fed his own selfish, carnal desires to the point that he did not even know that the Lord had left him until it was too late. You have to understand That God had given Samson every advantage. He had given him amazing gifts. And Samson threw it all away in favor of doing what was right in his own eyes. He fed his selfish desires and it led to his undoing. Understand this. God didn't take away Samson's ministry. Samson gave it away. God didn't take away his ministry. Samson just threw it all out so that he could enjoy life to its fullest. This is so incredibly sad and tragic. 
And perhaps the most grievous thing to me as I worked on this sermon this week were all of the faces of people I have known through the years that the same thing could be said of them. So many faces flooding back to my mind of people that had everything handed to them by God, every good gift, and they threw it away because they wanted something more than what God could give them in their mind. And they pursued selfish, carnal desires to feed their appetite, and they threw it all away. How sad. God had given them amazing gifts. They could have done great kingdom things, but they wasted God's gifts on selfish pursuits and disobedience. This morning, I want to plead with you from the very depths of my heart, don't waste God's gifts. Please understand that for every one of you who have embraced Jesus as Savior, you have been called and set apart by God himself. That's who you are. If you have embraced Christ as Savior, you have been called and set apart by God himself. Now, I am sure your birth was not preceded by a prophetic angelic announcement, but so what? God has placed a call on your life, and you now belong to him. That is an awesome and amazing thing to be celebrated, to be proclaimed to shout from the rooftops, I'm a child of the living God. I've been set apart. I'm called by him. That's who I am. And then the other thing about this is that because God has called you, he has also set you apart as holy unto him. Now, he's not placed a Nazarite vow upon your life like he did Samson, but he desires you to be holy and to honor him with your life. We are told by Jesus himself in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, that the greatest commandment for God's children is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Love God and love other people. And we also know from 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, be holy, be set apart, different from the world around you, and that you should avoid sexual immorality. Every week on Sundays, both at Bible communities and right here in the worship service, we intentionally as a church look at the Word of God to see what it is that He desires for us. His children. If you're not coming, come. Come. Give up an hour of sleep. Come to Bible communities. Learn from God's word. Others yet, many others, gather weekly for extra Bible study on top of that. Men meet Wednesday mornings at 6. Ladies meet Friday mornings. And then beginning in the fall, is it Tuesday or Wednesday? I can never keep track. Do we know? All right. Others yet meet in homes home groups, to look even more intently at God's word. I know that all of us are encouraged because I say it from the pulpit regularly to continually read the word of God on a regular basis so that you would know God's desire for you as his child. I can safely say, I know this beyond a shadow of a doubt, that anyone who has attended this church for a period of time does not have lack of opportunity to know God's word and therefore should not have a lack of knowledge. That should not define this church for anyone that's attended here for any length of time. The other thing that I know both from Scripture and experientially is that each and every one of you as a child of God has been given gifts to use for His service and His glory. I can tell you that emphatically as well. Each and every one of you as a child of God, you have been given gifts for his service and glory. In 1 Corinthians 12, we read about how God has given to each person certain gifts to be used to build up the body of Christ. And I can also tell you from just basic observation by getting to know each and every one of you 
that every single born-again believer who calls this church their home has been blessed with gifts from the Lord. You have them. I've seen them. Please do not waste your gifts. Too often what I observe in the body of Christ across the country and even at times right here in our church is that people do not have a lack of knowledge. They have a lack of obedience. They want certain things that the world has to offer. Relationships, money, prestige, enjoyment, whatever they can fill in the blank. And so they selfishly pursue those things even though they know they are not supposed to. And then they slowly slide away from the Lord thinking they can just carry on without any consequence whatsoever until one day, The Lord has left them to wallow in their choices and they don't even realize it. Please do not be that person. This is not a salvation issue that I'm talking about. Don't go there. God still loves you. He will never forsake you. His grace is sufficient and He does not love you any less when you sin or disobey. What it means is that you will be one of those Christians who live a life of quiet desperation because you have wasted your gifts and you now are experiencing a spiritually anemic life with no real joy. That's what it means. Please, please, I implore you, do not be that person. Samson had everything handed to him to be a great man. But he is only remembered as a strong man. He wasted the gifts God had given him on selfish worldly pursuits. What a tragic waste. What a tragedy. Understand that when you think only of yourself and what you desire in your flesh without any consideration to what the Lord wants, it will always lead you into trouble. Always. You will wind up living a life that wastes your God-given gifts. And one day you may awaken to find out that God has left you to wallow in the results of your sinful pursuits. But, When you allow the Holy Spirit to control your life and you seek first God's kingdom and righteousness, you will put those gifts to good use. You will be fruitful and you will draw other people unto the Lord. You will enjoy God's presence on a continual basis. And life is a whole lot better. If Samson could tell us one thing, if we could bring him up here and he could tell us one thing, I believe he would say this morning, please do not waste God's gifts. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have gifted and called apart and set apart every single person who belongs to you right here in this church. And Lord, I pray and I ask that you would just help us to not selfishly pursue the things that the world has to offer. Help us, Father, to want to honor you. Help us, Father, to want to enjoy you, to serve you, to obey you, and put those good gifts to good use. pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I invite the praise team up. We're going to close with one last song this morning, and response to what we've heard and i can tell you this just in preparation um, i'm going to be going on vacation here after next sunday um, but i have decided and you can be praying about this too that with all the things that have been going on over the last couple months with all of the lgbt whatever other letters you want to put in there i'm going to take some time and talk about it about what our response should be as a christian believer as a church and so we'll uh We'll wade into that next Sunday. And so you can be praying that uh, we hear from the Lord as well.
Let's stand together and let's, um, let's worship our Lord.